Hello everyone, my name is Georgie Dent and I am going to be the moderator of this um, exciting event today. I just wanted to jump on quickly and let you know that we will be um, kicking off in a few more minutes when it gets closer um, to the hour. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Women in Tech Are We There Yet event. My name is Georgie Dent and I am absolutely thrilled to be the moderator of this conversation today.
I would like to begin by acknowledging the, the traditional owners of the land on which we are all meeting. Today, we are going to discuss the challenges that are facing women in technology. And to do that, I've got three fantastic panelists who are gonna be participating. Um, here also in Sydney, we've got Emma Jones, who is the CEO and founder of Project F. Welcome, Emma. In Perth, we have the Shell Australia CIO, Angela Lamb. And in Auckland, we have uh, Watercare's CDO and New Zealand's 2020 CIO of the year, Rebecca Chenery. Welcome, Angela and Rebecca. Now, despite many conversations about diversity and um, gender in technology, women remain underrepresented, underpaid, and they continue to face discrimination. We want to discuss the roadblocks that continue to challenge women in tech. And we're really wanting today to capture your experiences, your first-hand experiences, so that we can put that into a report that can be shared with talents, 9,000 plus clients around the world. Now, the way we're going to capture that information today is via live polling. Now, no one needs to worry. Um, this, no personally, uh, no, none of your personal information is going to be captured and can be used. It is anonymous um, polling. So please um, feel free to answer safely in the knowledge that no one is going to be using this information personally identified to you. Now, to kick off, we're going to have a few questions um, first, just to sort of get that capture some of the demographic information that will obviously be relevant to this report. And the way that this is going to work is that polls will pop up on your screen um, and I will get you to take a moment to fill that out. And then we'll continue um, on to the first um, section of the panel discussion. Um, so I believe that those questions should be popping up on your screens very shortly. And they are, there they are. While you are filling out these questions, I thought it would be useful for me to explain the thinking um, behind this event and really why talent landed on and having an event like this. I think lots of you can probably relate to the experience of attending fantastic events where you hear from phenomenal speakers sharing fantastic insights about the, the barriers that are preventing women from um, progressing in different careers. Um, and yet walking away with this sense of, well, how are we going to actually put that into action? And how are we going to really shift the dial um, and, and make a change? And we really thought that today, trying to capture this information firsthand from you will really help. The, talent team have said one of the questions that they are asked more than anything is how do they improve diversity? How do they get more uh, women into their tech teams? And so we are hoping that by sharing your experiences, um, we will be able to create a really full picture that can help educate talent's clients um, to ideally shift the dial. So we are going to kick off by well, we're going to work through the stages of a career in tech. That's the sort of the time frame that we're going to use for going through these questions. So it's only natural that we start at the beginning. Um, and while to kick this off, I'd really like to ask Angela for your views on why women do remain outnumbered in tech to this day. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I think there are a number of reasons why you see that women are outnumbered in tech. If we look at first the fundamental reason, there just aren't enough of us in STEM disciplines. Um, that's, I think, the starting point. Um, when I first started looking at diversity um, in a mining organisation that I worked for, and we looked at looking at um, numbers for um, diversity targets, um, and we did a lot of research around understanding um, the number of women in engineering roles, in computer science roles, um, associated with, um, you know, STEM-related um, activities. And the reality was that if we were looking at a target of 30%, there just weren't enough incoming young talent into university degrees to actually get that 30% target. Um, so the reality is, is that actually how do you grow the pipeline? It's about, you know, going further back 
in that and looking at you know high school and primary school and um, encouraging um, young ladies to basically be interested in engineering and science and STEM related activities and you see some fantastic um, you know activities at the moment happening particularly on the west coast around she moves and coding coder dojos also Grease Stone who's actually one of my um, mentors in the past when I was mining running the um, youth um, enhancement program going to high schools and talking to um, young ladies in high schools and encourage them to actually get you know into um, you know STEM related courses and activities and getting involved and we need to work that pipeline to actually grow that pipeline actively so that you actually do have women in these you know disciplines and capabilities that we actually can recruit into the organization so I think that's one part of it the other part of it is how do you actually keep them in there and give them the level of opportunity and engagement um, that they need to grow their networks and to actually seek out those opportunities. And that's where networking comes into it to actually, you know, make connections with, you know, people who can help grow your network, who can help grow your capability, introduce you to other people, referrals, so that, you know, you can actually to continue that, you know, career and growth development, whether it be in the current organisation that you're at um, or in another organisation. Um, so, you know, Know, there's definitely two sides to that and it's um, it's challenging on both fronts but we all have a role to play in that regardless um, to actually you know grow that capability and pay it forward in my view yeah okay thank you that's um, yeah fantastic insights there that I think really point to why we still have that disparity um, we've now got a question for the audience um, so if you want to have a think about this question um, what you think have been the biggest hurdles that you've faced in the hiring process. Um, and we'll give you a second there to fill it out. And then we will be able to um, talk to the results because obviously we will be getting a lot of this in, in live, in real time. Um, so when we, when everyone's had a moment to sort of fill that out, I'm really interested to see which which one of these. Wow, isn't that interesting? Okay, so there we go. We've got 40% have said that self-deselecting based on the feeling that you don't meet 100% of the criteria. Now that is very interesting um, because that is something that has come up uh, across many different fields um, you know not just tech but in politics in banking in finance in law so many uh, women really you know there's that classic research that showed you know a woman won't apply for a job if she if she doesn't meet all of the criteria where we know that men are more likely to apply for a job even if they meet three or four of the criteria um, so really interesting there to see that that is something that you are acknowledging that is an issue for you of sort of deselecting yourself from the process before it even begins. Now, once you are in the door, let's have a look at what are the opportunities for progressing. Um, and Emma, I'd like to ask a question to you now about what are the obstacles that you think women in tech face when it comes to opportunities for development and promotions? Yeah, um, thanks, Georgie. Great question. Um, so I had a good think about this beforehand. And, and actually, I, I think there are three main obstacles um, for women trying to get promoted or progress. And bearing in mind that 56% of women in technology leave technology at the midpoint of their career, which is more than double the number of men. And it's not to have children. So, you know, you don't leave an industry sector to have children. You might leave a job for a little while and come back. So there are some quite clear reasons, but the obstacles are, so one of the biggest ones is um, something that was, defined by the, uh, the principal developer at Squarespace in New York, Tanya Riley, about three years ago, and she gave a talk on it that went viral, and it's called Glue Work. So what happens is um, the engineering team success is not just about churning out code. It's there's, there's a lot more to the success of a team, and a lot of that falls to or is taken by women. So when I talk about glue work, what we're talking about is the stuff that is less glamorous um, and seen as, as less promotable. Um, so it's things like 
writing documentation, setting up team meetings, improving new member onboarding, mentoring and coaching more junior team men members, um, in improving processes, that kind of thing. Um, and what research has shown is that women volunteer for non-promotable work 48% more of the time. And that managers ask women to do this kind of work 44% more of the time. So it really can be career limiting. So the reality is, is that it can push women into less technical roles and, and even out of the industry. So it's known as, as glue work. And I'd certainly, you know, recommend anybody to watch Tanya Riley's um, talk on it. You can search it up and there's, um, there are videos of her. It's about half an hour, but it's really worth watching and really understanding and for managers to understand this. Um, the second one is, uh, I think, in and out groups. So we've created a very social environment in technology, which feels great. You know, from the outside, it can look great and very cool. And we talk about lots of social activity in technology. But the dangerous downside of that is that it can create in and out groups. And if you think about, I use this in talks I give quite regularly. Um, if you think about the series of Friends, where um, if everybody's watched Friends, and I think most people probably have, and I know I've watched them all many times, there's the one where Rachel smokes. And that's a really good example of how in and out groups are created, whereby you create these social environments and you get people who will gravitate towards certain activities. And in tech, quite often it's centered around drinking or it's centered around things that are outside or after work. Um, and it's centered around things like sport or gaming. So there's PlayStations, ping pong tables, tournaments, craft beer and so on. And if you're not part of those groups, you miss out on informal um, you know, uh, involvement with or informal introductions to and sponsorships by people that can help you in your career and projects, exposure to, to projects, those kinds of things. Um, and that's what happens with Rachel. So her team smokes, she doesn't, and she misses out on a lot of um, projects and activities and parties and gatherings and so on um, because she's not out smoking. So she starts to smoke. Um, but in, in the you know, tech environment, this really does affect women's ability to progress. And it also creates favoritism. So it, you see this kind of thing coming out in the language that's used in performance review data, which is something that we examine when we work with our customers. Um, and you can see the language and the, the, the wording that's used to describe uh, performance and reviewing performance is quite skewed based on this kind of social activity and, and what leads to favoritism. Certainly not intentional, but it does happen. Um, and the third one is presenteeism. So women quite often are uh, the ones who are working more flexibly or part time. Um, and what that means is that they often don't have access to, to opportunities for development and promotion. So there are some really clear barriers for women in technology. And we have to look quite closely at systems and processes in order to disrupt that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, as I'm sure you know, particularly with that presenteeism with COVID, we certainly know that there seems to have been a much greater uptake of working from home and flexibility among women. And then you think, well, that's going to create an, you know, another situation where in the office, the opportunities for who's the in crowd and who's the out crowd, you can see that that might not advantage women. Um, so now we are going to have, we've got two poll questions now that we're going to pop up um, that really relate to, uh, how you have experienced opportunities for promotion and development. Um, so there's two questions here that you can answer. I did also mean to let everybody know that I do sound like I've got a cold because I do have a cold, but it is definitely not COVID. That's the good news. And I also checked that you definitely cannot contract COVID via Zoom. So everybody is safe. Um, all right. Okay. So what have we got? Okay. Well, look, this is good. So 30% disagree that you have been overlooked for promotions due to gender. Okay. So that's quite good news. 
that 17% strongly agree with that, 28% agree. Do you see a clear path for your career at your current employer? Yes and no. Well, that's interesting, isn't it? That's a bit sad in a way that there are more of you that feel that there is no clear path for your career. Um, Emma, I just want to ask you now about the critical issue of pay, um, which obviously is relevant regardless of what field that you work in. But we do know the pay gap is greater in tech than it is in other industries. Why is that? Well, there's, um, a, there's a, there are a few things that play into that. One of the most prevalent is a phenomenon known as the expectation gap. So we have a tendency to be quite secretive about pay in this country and a number of other countries. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big driver of the pay gap. Certainly in technology, what you'll find is that uh, most people are asked for their expectations when they apply for a role. So a recruiter or a talent acquisition person will ask for somebody to give their expectations. And sometimes it's man a mandatory field when you're applying for a job. Unfortunately, the research tells us that when men and women graduate in technology, women's expectations are ever so slightly higher than men's, but then that quickly changes. So within the first year that crosses over and uh, men's and women's then start to go in different directions. And that continues through the rest of their career. And what we see is that men on average will have expectations on average every year for about a $12,000 increase, whereas women's will only be around about seven or $8,000. So over time, that can create quite a significant gap in expectation. And we have biases at play when we, unconscious biases, when we are asking these questions, we will get anchored to the number that we're given us when we're asking that expectation. And that's one of the biggest causes of, um, of the pay gap. It's around 7% higher in Australia and England and in the US. So this is a real problem for us here. And we're not looking closely enough at the data in our own companies to pick this up. And even when we are, there's evidence that shows that actually companies even who, who do the analysis, quite often they don't take action once they find out where the gaps are. So there's a, there's a, a few things at play here. Uh, but the expectation gap is one of the, the biggest causals um, of this and something that we can change by creating transparent pay. So in order to change it, companies need to be very clear about what constitutes a, um, a role level. So for skill, behavior, impact and so on, they're very clear about what is a junior, a mid, a senior, a lead, etc. Um, and they can document that and then tie that to pay ranges and communicate pay ranges when they advertise for new roles that will completely change the, and, and level the playing field. There'll be no requirement for people to ask somebody what they think they should be paid. And it's not the case that women are less confident or less good at negotiation. Again, the, the, the research tells us that they're just as good at it. They have no major issues with doing it necessarily. So it's certainly no more than, than men. Um, the difference is they actually are awarded what they ask for less frequently. Mm, very interesting. And I mean, the other thing, and I don't know if this is specific to tech, but I do know that the data shows that when women do press for more money, they are ultimately punished because they're sort of breaking the mould of what's expected of females which is to be very conciliatory and collaborative and you know right. asking for money kind of breaks away from that um, but yeah I think that is really interesting about the expectation gap and what employers um, can do so we are now going to ask you guys for your um, for some of your thoughts on the thorny issue of of pay um, and I guess you know the interesting thing with a question like this is because of that lack of transparency, you don't always know what the people around you um, get paid. Um, and so it is, it is hard. I've certainly, I, I know anecdotally, a lot of times when you do find out what your colleagues earn, it can be quite um, shocking to sort of discover that, for, you know, someone in the same organisation doing a very similar role is getting paid considerably more. So I'm interested to see where you land on this one. Okay. 
okay, so you disagree that you are paid exactly the same way and strongly disagree. So not quite a majority there, but there is obviously the sense that you're not paid exactly the same as your male colleagues. Um, and that, I mean, we certainly know that the, the data bears that out, doesn't it? Um, now, Angela, I would love to bring you in now because we're going to talk a little bit about um, leadership and sponsorship. And I was wondering whether you could tell us a little bit about how, what you perceive as the importance of, of sponsors compared to mentors. Sure. Look, I think that sponsors and mentors both have a role to play in your career, and they certainly have in my 20 career in IT. I wouldn't be the leader I am today if it wasn't for the sponsors and mentors that I've had during the time um, in my career. Um, and they're both male and female. So, you know, um, if I start really early in my career, when I first started out in IT, I started at Lottery West and um, the CEO's name was Jan Stewart. And Jan was, you know, fundamental in helping to, you know, shape the leader that I am and giving me the opportunities really early in my career. Um, I remember coming off maternity leave. Um, my son is 15 now and um, six months out of maternity leave. And she gave me the opportunity to run the IT department, join the executive team coming off maternity leave. And that was, you know, foundational for me and going, oh, hey, look, you know, I can do this and I can do that. It's not necessarily a choice I actually have to make. Um, and, you know, the opportunity to work part time, this is 15 years ago, mind you. So like, you know, to work from home. Um, and I remember having a conversation with her one day and goes, yeah, that time doesn't really work for me, that executive meeting because you know breastfeeding cycles and things like that and she's like that's fine I'll move the executive meeting and that was like you know she didn't even just she didn't even have to think about it. it's like how can we actually accommodate this and actually make it work for you so she opened doors in terms of opportunity um, to you know for example to run the IT function at the time but also to create an environment where it made it possible for me to actually do that and I didn't feel guilty you know as a mother and also you know as a leader of a, um, a department that you know I could actually do both um, so you know that's one example in my career when I moved to W Police and I worked with a gentleman called Craig Ward um, again you know very very um, open to um, acknowledging, um, you know, those opportunities and sponsoring those opportunities to represent WA police and international forums and local forums around you like policing, um, but also at the same breath going, sure, you can't find a babysitter, bring Andrew in. He can sit over there and draw on the whiteboard with the architects at the same time. That's all good, which he did. <laughs> so we started him training him early. Um, so that's where, you know, sponsors, you know, provide that opportunity to open the door and provide that environment in your workplace to help make that happen. But at the same time it's not mutually exclusive they can be mentors as well and so a lot of the sponsors I've had as I've moved on from different roles have actually you know been my mentors there's one that from Lottery West days I still keep in contact with him 20 years later I might not talk to him for like a year or so and then out of the blue we'll have a conversation something that's sort of bothering me you know it's more a sounding board and to listen um you know there's 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 no politics there. They don't know the players. You know, it's an independent view to sort of, you know, help you kind of work through a problem. And that's how I tend to use mentors um, in, in, in that space. Um, if I look at my current experience with Shell, and I started during COVID, so about six months ago. Um, so the whole onboarding experience was quite an interesting one. And they actually have a fantastic support structure around both sponsors and mentors. So my boss is global. I've never actually met her face to face. So I've only ever met her through VC. And I'm in awe of, you know, um, what she actually does. She has four kids. She runs a global function. Um, and, you know, every time I've asked her to get that level of support to, you know, oh, who do I speak to in global about this or that? You know, she's there to kind of provide those opportunities and support to actually make that happen. And also, you know, I have a mentor assigned, you know, who works in the global team as well to support that. So, you know, in my career, it's a bit of both, right? And I think that, you know, you can have sponsors who are mentors, um, at the same time and they're both really really important and from my perspective I've done a lot of work working with you know interns and grads and I'm very passionate about that and I used to run that program when I was working in a mining company before um, and I still keep in contact with some of those guys through that mentorship program and that intern program I still keep in contact with some of the people that I actually mentored from Lottery West days as well and police days um, so you know it's one of those things that you know but you've got to get that personal connection I think with a mentor that's a fundamental difference so you've got to be able to click and with them um, and a bit like you know an old friend where you can kind of just like reconnect with them you know you might not have spoken to them for a year or two but you can reconnect and have a really robust honest conversation 
Yeah, I think that's really interesting, isn't it? And I guess, you know, you talk there about um, Shell being really prescriptive about having those, those mentor roles set up. And I think that actually is a really fantastic idea because you can't assume that every single person will necessarily have the capacity to build those personal relationships that will form the sort of support of formal mentorships or sponsorships um, going on. Now, we're going to um, ask a question now um, of you in relation to this. Um, do you have a sponsor, someone who is more senior than you, who advocates for you and puts you forward for opportunities? To what extent do you agree with this statement? Agree, and lots of strongly agrees too. Well, I mean, look, that's fantastic that there is that there are so many of you that do have that um, sponsorship available to you. Undecided, disagree, strongly disagree is definitely the bigger number overall, which, I mean, it is quite close, but considering how powerful a sponsor can be, I think that one is pretty, pretty telling. Um, now, Rebecca, I would love to bring you in. Welcome. Um, and I'd love to talk to you about what are some of the challenges that you think women in tech face on a on a day-to-day -day basis? Thanks, Georgie. Uh, it's great to be here today. I think really picking up uh, on a couple of the points that Angela and Emma have already um, mentioned. First and foremost, uh, on a daily basis, there's a really visible underrepresentation of women, particularly in senior roles in tech. And that means that women have to look a long way and really hard to see themselves. So that, um, that affects, I guess, the extent to which they can see role models and the extent to which they feel comfortable putting themselves forward. That lack of representation means that so many of the things that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, so hiring policies, business processes, remuneration policies, have been affected by um, the lack of women pushing forward and changing those things. I think the glacial pace of change around those including things like networking. I'm sure we can all relate to the number of times we've been invited to a golf day or asked whether we want to go fishing or do you want to come to the rugby? Um, all of which are you know, um, activities that I myself might ultimately say yes and thank you for the invitation. But they're probably not right in my wheelhouse and in some respects they're probably another instance where I feel obliged to try and prove myself. You know, so many of the things that we deal with daily just haven't been designed with women in mind. And the lack of women represented in the tech sector means you're not really getting that push through to change those things. And if you think about how that plays out in, in the world outside of tech, it's right down to really small things like beautiful paving stones that are used to cobble the footpath that are wonderful to look at. But if you're wearing a pair of high heels, they're just about a death trap. Now, so we live in a world that fundamentally hasn't been designed um, with women in mind. But I think uh, for me personally, by far the most significant challenge that I uh, deal with on a daily basis, um, and it links back to one of the poll um, responses earlier, is actually the challenge I put on myself. Um, it, it is that, um, that constant need to try and prove yourself. It is the overarching um, imposter syndrome. It is the fact that no one can put more challenge on me than I would put on myself. That constant strive for perfectionism, um, and I guess the, the the strive to set the standard that is completely unrealistic. And I know that it's completely unrealistic, and yet we continue to do it anyway. Um, so I think, you know, that linking back to the, the fact that a lot of women deselect out of these processes, we know that this is a thing. I think we are increasingly talking more and more about this being a thing. We know that women are wired differently to men. Our challenge is how do we embrace that rather than continu continuing to fight that? Um, how do we accept that um, no one needs to be perfect in an imperfect world um, and move forward in a constructive way to improve the situation? Yeah, it's really interesting. I think that um, I don't think I've ever met a woman in all of, you know, I've, I've been a business journalist for a long time and I don't think I've ever met a female leader um, who has not admitted to experiencing that imposter syndrome. Um, and then just recently this year, I've seen a few bits and pieces being written about the idea that 
we live in a world, as you you said, that hasn't been designed with women in mind. And we are trying to occupy these roles that haven't been occupied by women before, or certainly not, you know, it, the dominant position has not been being occupied by women. Therefore, it's sort of inevitable that we feel this imposter syndrome. It's not actually something that's in our head. There's a really genuine explanation for why women might feel that um, in a way that men don't. And I, I think that actually it really made me stop and think that a lot of the fantastically talented women I know who are doing brilliant things who have that sense of imposter syndrome, it's because they are breaking the mould and they're, they're taking on roles that haven't traditionally been held by women. Um, and I think, you know, again, that idea of, of taking pressure off yourself or, or really being conscious, as you have said there, Rebecca, about the unrealistic standards that you're putting on yourself is, is really important. Um, we're now going to ask you about the, the challenges that you encounter in your working environment. Um, and I mean, look, I think it would, yeah, I think it is fair to say that in 2021, the conversation more broadly around the experience of women in different workplaces is definitely, it's ratcheted up a notch, I would say. Um, and I think that we are sort of having more nuanced conversations about what does it feel like to be a woman in, in a particular workplace? Um, and obviously we know that at the, at the worst end of the spectrum, it is the horrendous, horrendous instances of sexual harassment and even sexual assault in workplaces. But even things like being spoken over or not having a seat at the table, those things really contribute to it to a sense that you're not quite as welcome. You know, you're not quite as in um, as the in crowd, as, as Emma sort of talked about then. Okay, yep, so not having a seat at the table or being included in decision-making conversations. That's interesting. And I guess, I wonder if, and maybe you can pop, if you've got any responses to this, you could pop it in the chat function that they are being looked at and they will be collated later. Um, but do you think that's because those decision-making conversations are happening somewhere where you're not? Like, are they the conversations that are happening at the drinks after work? Or is it a matter of it's happening in the workplace, but you're just not in that meeting? I don't know whether there's a, I don't know whether there's a huge difference between those concepts, but I think it is, um, as Emma sort of highlighted, talking about how the workplace operates and how that culture operates is really important to think about. Um, now we are going to discuss that topic of becoming parents. And uh, we do know that the motherhood penalty is very severe um, in Australia in all fields. Emma, do you think there are challenges for women coming back from parental leave in tech? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, I think tech is probably one of the worst. Um, somebody once said, I actually well, quite recently, and I wish I could remember who it was, but they said when um, companies are as fearful of hiring men as they are of hiring women, we might get close to equality. And I think that's really true. And you can see it in technology environments where there are so few women. Um, and when you start having conversations about equal parental leave, and then you hear um, some of the, uh, you know, the responses to that, then you start to really get it. Um, and I do quite a lot of work with tech startups where we try and um, help them to get ahead of gender diversity issues right at the beginning. And one of the, the things that we ask of them is to implement equal parental leave right at the beginning. So it takes a woman on average, in, in an engineer, um, a, on average six years to get back to where she was once she's returned from parental leave. And I think our attitudes are a, a, a lot to do with that. Um, so the attitude, the, the expectation that a woman coming back after a period of leave is going to be any less capable than, or, you know, you don't forget this stuff necessarily, things might move on quickly, but, you know, these people are doing these jobs because they're, you know, they're good at them, they're te technically savvy, and um, you, you don't suddenly forget how to code. But something Angela said a little bit earlier um, struck a chord with me on this. Um, she was talking about a... Uh, a global leader 
uh, a woman and she said, you know, I don't you know, I'd take my hand off to her as to how she's done it. She's a global leader of um, this organization with four children. But we don't make those comments about men. We don't talk about men in senior positions as, oh, how does he do it? He's got four children. It kind of just doesn't come into the conversation. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges for women is that they're judged based on being a parent. And there's a penalty for not talking about it or not, or, or being full-time and working long hours or whatever somebody wants to do or being more senior, we kind of almost to, to some degree expect women to be more sort of seen to be more caring and nurturing and spending more time with their children. And if they don't, then they're seen as being, you know, cold or harsh or uncaring. Um, and it was Katrina Wallace, who's the CEO of Flamingo AI, she calls herself an unmother. She said, I am that mother who misses the kids' sports days and whatever. She said, but, you know, do I have any less of a bond and love for my children than my husband? No. Or than anybody else? No. She said, that's just the path that I've chosen. Um, so I think, you know, the things that we can do to, to change this, and I think that's what I'd certainly like to see us get to, is that we have to normalise parenting across all genders, mm. so all carers equally. And it's currently not, we're not there yet. We're quite far away from that right now. And I think equal parental leave will make a big difference. Removing the carer labels, primary, secondary, that stuff's all really outdated. There's no reason to have that those things anymore. It's just, just sort of old school HR, traditional stuff. So removing those, and if you look at Linktree, um, the company, they've just implemented a, an equal parental, an equal carers policy that is incredibly holistic and very progressive. Um, Issa Notaman is the, uh, she's their, their head of people there, and she was the head of diversity and inclusion for Spotify for quite a few years and incredibly pro progressive in how she thinks about these things. So they're going to benefit from that dramatically. Equal parental leave will come about at some point. Companies need to get on board with it sooner rather than later as a, an accelerator of equality. So men need to be stepping up and, and taking the leave that they're given. Only one in 20 men in Australia takes his parental leave entitlement, which is a, a, a you know, not a great stat. Um, but in technology, certainly, I think what we should listen to our men. They want to take parental leave. They want to be part of their children's lives. The knock-on effect of them not doing so creates a dynamic in every family that is very hard to shift. Women become seen as being the primary carer um, and they don't, they shouldn't have to be, men lose confidence, you know, if they're not there for a period of time, like 24 seven, as women are at the beginning. Um, and we shouldn't tell people who should be primary, who should be secondary, they should just all be parents and share that care equally. It'll make a big difference in the long run. And that certainly I think in, in technology is a, is a, a a key focus point we have to normalize the equal share of care yeah i i could not agree more um and i think it, it is also really um relevant to consider that broader context because i i agree with you completely that there are things that employers can and should be looking at doing but i think we also need to look at the social um environment in which men and women are starting families and having families in Australia. And just last week, UNICEF um, published a piece of research. They looked at the 41 richest countries in the world and looked at um, access to paid parental leave and access to affordable quality early education and care. And Australia ranked 37th out of 41 for access to paid parental leave and 37th out of um, 41 for access and affordability to early childhood education and care. Just yesterday in Canberra, we had in the coalition party room, three men talking about the fact that subsidising childcare is problematic because it's encouraging mothers to outsource parenting. Now, that's pretty extraordinary when you think almost every single male, po male politician we've ever had in Australia who's had children has outsourced parenting, if to use that language. Um, and so I think we do have to be really outspoken and vocal about the need 
to shift those policy settings so that we can give um, men and women the opportunity to, to engage as carers and as workers more equitably. Um, so yeah, there's so much, so much to be done there. Now we've got a question here about uh, your experience, um, if about family responsibilities um, and the impact that that has on women in tech. I did see a few comments pop up on the screen. Um, and I mean, the other thing that is shocking that we don't talk about enough is that pregnancy remains the number one workplace discrimination, um, the form of discrimination. So we know that one in two women in Australia report discrimination um, either while they're pregnant, on parental leave or in the first year back to work. Now that's one in two and that's reported discrimination. Um, what type of impact? Okay, yes. Yeah, so negative impact or strong. So 54% have agreed that having family responsibilities has got a very negative impact on a woman's career in tech, which is really disappointing. Um, and I think probably most disappointing is that I don't think that's a perceived problem. You know, I think from just from the kind of comments that I'm seeing come up that we know that it is, it actually is a, it is a difficult thing for lots of um, women. Now we are going to touch on the idea about staying, what keeps people like ret retaining your career in tech. Um, and Rebecca, I'm keen to ask you, has there ever been a time where you considered leaving your career in tech? Yeah, thanks, Roger. I had to think really hard about this question, to be honest. Um, and I think I can honestly say that whilst like everyone, I have good days and bad days, I I really love what I do. I'm super passionate about the opportunities that come with a role in tech and the opportunity for tech to really change the world. So I, I think I can safely say I haven't um, considered walking away from a career in tech. I definitely think that I have considered, you know, in the heat of the moment, throwing my arms up in the air and going, oh, it's all too much and it's all too hard um, and walking away from a role, but not walking away from a career in tech. What I would say about that, um, you know, and somewhat disappointingly and maybe slightly controversially, is that some of the most crunchy situations that I have dealt with have been with other women. Um, and, you know, our, I think we have to keep ourselves really honest around the fact that there are, there are still behaviours um, among women towards women that are really counterproductive. Um, going back to Angela's comment around sponsorship and holding up other women and celebrating in that success, there is still a thread, I think, of people being really threatened by the success of a woman. And some of those people that are threatened are, in fact, women. Um, and, you know, that has been my personal experience. Uh, and I think uh, slightly ironic given the topic that we're talking about, but we should be alive to the fact that this is not, um, you know, this is not a situation that is generated by men. This is about actually how we work collectively together to improve the situation for women in tech, to get better representation and to support those women in staying and being successful. And that is a role for both men and women. Yeah, absolutely. I guess, yeah. And I think, I think that that is probably not an uncommon experience. I certainly know that um, I often have brought up to me because I do write and advocate for, for women a lot, you know, that issue of, well, what, it's not just men who necessarily behave badly. Um, and I think the thing is what we need to work towards is a world in which men and women have the opportunity to both be fantastic, both be terrible. Like there are going to be terrible female bosses, just as we know there are terrible male bosses. But I think also when there is that sort of scarcity mindset, which I think is often what does lead to those toxic interactions that, if women, if because there are fewer leadership positions, if one woman has one, another woman represents a really significant threat in a way that I don't think men necessarily represent to each other because there's just more opportunities for them. Um, I would just, Angela or Emma, have you got any comments about, have, you, have either of you ever entertained the idea of leaving your career in, in tech? 
Um, look, I'm happy to answer that. To be honest, no, I love what I do. Um, I sort of fell into tech. I actually thought I was going to be an accountant or somebody in finance, um, but that didn't happen, obviously. Um, and uh, I fell into technology and I love the ability to, you know, how can tech enable and actually transform and make somebody's work life easier or safer? And for me, that's where the buzz is, and particularly working in the transformational space to actually help organisations move to that next stage um, in terms of where they're at. So, you know, I I love it. It's always about lifelong learning, I think, in technology. There's always something new actually happening. Um, but it's more about, you know, how do I actually work with the business to actually enable and use technology as an enabler? So personally, no, I haven't really thought about that. I love what I do. According to um, one organisation, 82% of the women who leave technology mid-career uh, because of the reasons that we've talked about, um, they actually love what they do. So that, that's actually really sad that they feel driven out by lack of support and lack of ability to progress their careers, which are the, the top two reasons why those women do leave. Um, you know, that the problems are systemic. The challenges, I should say, for, for women in tech are systemic. I personally, you know, I, I work, I'm not actually a technologist, so it's a bit different, you know, and, and the work that I'm doing is the stuff that I love and I've been working in the technology environment for decades and I, I love it as Angela says it's incredibly progressive and exciting and there's so much opportunity and the other thing is that you're shaping the future of the world what's what could be better than that you know you're building stuff you're creating amazing exciting new stuff all the time um, you know and I just think that's really exciting yeah Okay, great. Well, let's, we've got a poll for you now about staying in tech um, and why you believe women leave at a higher rate than men. Now, full disclosure, I'm not, obviously, as you can see, I'm not sitting at a computer, so I don't have full access to all of the comments, but I'm seeing bits and pieces that are popping up and I can see some really interesting comments about the experience of being a woman who isn't interested in, in having children or isn't interested in having children at this point. And I think, Again, that stereotype that a woman's worth is entirely tied up with whether or not she is a mother is really problematic. And I don't want to be naive, but I'm really optimistic that if we move to a world in which we look at parents as carers, not just mums, but parents, mums and dads, then the expectation doesn't need to fall so heavily on women to be mothers as the... Okay, so what have we... Right, interesting. So... Lack of advancement opportunities, 47% of you have said that is why you believe women leave tech roles at a higher rate than men. Male dominated culture, caretaking, long hours, isolation, sexual harassment, even though there's only 6% that worries me and lack of effective sponsors. Okay. So now we're going to touch on uh, what I think can only be described as a pretty unique year. I think 2020 and even 2021 is turning out to be full of surprises and challenges. Um, Rebecca, I might start with you. What impact do you think the pandemic has had at all on, on women in tech roles? Uh, yeah, I think uh, some really um, positive impacts and some not so positive impacts. So um, the notion of flexibility, I think it, it really has proven to us that actually um, workplace flexibility is a thing. Um, it doesn't um, uh, impact productivity and in many cases it improves productivity and the, and the traditional boundaries around the work day are increasingly becoming blurred and that works for people. So I think organizations that weren't already on that journey um, have been you know accelerated if you like into that um, that flexible working journey and for women obviously who have potentially been needing to work flexibly for a really long period of time now where they may have been able to uh, not able to achieve that or have to operate within you know constraints and boundaries I think it's just been a, a transformational change in that respect so you know really positive. On the flip side, and again from my personal experience, I would say it was an incredibly intense time um, and I found myself in a position of um, trying to make up for years of guilt of being a full-time working mum 
uh, the, the boundaries between the work day and the home day became really blurred. And I find my, found myself doing, you know, crazy things like um, asking my children, I have three kids, um, what they wanted for morning tea and rushing out and making them a batch of scones whilst being on a call at the same time because I could, because I was at home with them and I felt like this was something that I had um, failed to achieve, you know, in being a full-time working mum um, since I'd had kids. And the pressure that that again put on me that I put on myself was incredibly intense and really difficult to deal with. So I think uh, where, there's, where there was issues around you know, feeling absent, um, feeling like I wasn't and we aren't being everything to everyone, I think COVID really um, amplified those and, and caused all sorts of very strange behaviour that I now personally reflect on and go, what on earth was I thinking? Yeah, how did you sort of manage to... to look sort of come to that realization and step back and say oh this and I will confess I'm also a parent of three children and I can completely relate to what you're saying about sort of feeling like we've got to compensate in other areas but I'm interested in what sort of pushed you to a place where you thought okay goodness this is not working yeah um two um really distinct separate lockdowns actually to be honest so the the first lockdown we had in New Zealand um right at the beginning of the pandemic um the fear of the unknown and um, you know, the, the fact that the country was very, very locked down. That was the period of time during which I, um, the, these, these feelings of needing to compensate for being absent really amplified and I spent my time baking and on calls and working all sorts of hours with no boundaries around that. Having come out of that lockdown, I realised just how intense that was, and um, how unhealthy that was, how tethered to my desk I was, um, and, and to be honest, I was just completely exhausted. So, in some respects, I came back to the office for a rest. <laughs> you know, we, we we got a little bit of normality, and then we went down into another lockdown. And, and the lesson really was was from the first lockdown was to not repeat the lessons of the second lockdown. Mm. Um, so there were a whole lot of things I did differently. I consumed less wine in the second lockdown. I got myself out more. The kids were quite capable of making their own morning tea. Um, and I found a better balance in the second lockdown. Yeah, well, well done. I mean, wasn't it? It's just, it was such an interesting and remains an interesting experiment um, in that it really did change our lives in ways that we didn't um, expect. Um, Emma, did you have any comments there on on the impact that COVID and has had on women in tech? Um, I think there's some quite a few stats, obviously, about this, and um, that show that it did impact women more greatly than it, it impacted men. But there's this unconscious bias that we have, all of us, that men are the providers. And so there's a you know almost priority given to men when it comes to rehiring. Well, he's got a family to support, you know that kind of a um, an attitude. And it's not, again, it's not intentional. These are unconscious biases that we all have, where we see men as the providers. Um, and obviously, then you know they're incorrect today because it it's it falls to all of us now as parents to provide for our families not just men but that means unfortunately that it filters down into giving men more of a um a crack at the whip than women um and the other thing is of course the presenteeism and abs absenteeism so where women when the pandemic hit obviously was you know having to eventually stay at home and you know seen as being the ones that had to do more of the parenting you know men would be seen to and I, I say the word seen you know actively that we're talking about the presenteeism so they're seen to be there more and consequently they're then seen as being more important um, and it's, it was just an unfortunate outcome of that there were some really good things that came out of it as well though so you know it was kind of there was some good and some bad but absolutely it was it, it wasn't a great thing for any parents I don't think or um, you know uh, women in general through the, the pandemic definitely came out worse off um, but there were some very clear things we can see out of that that we that can be changed and addressed to to make sure it doesn't happen in the future yeah fantastic okay well we've got a question now on that we are getting closer to the end of this session we've got one more um, poll after this one but how would you describe the impact of the pandemic on women in tech
positive, negative, undecided. I'll give you 10 more seconds on this one. Okay, yeah, so there's not, I think that those answers sort of reflect what we just heard from the panellists, that there sort of, there were some positive aspects that came out of COVID, but there also were some negative impacts. And I guess probably the challenge is now with the information we have about the impact COVID had, how do we re-engineer the path forward so that we can sort of capitalise on the positive things that happened and avoid further perpetuating this this idea I do think that idea about um, men still being more visible and more men being back in the offices I think there is potential risk there um, to women um, now the last uh, question that we're going to and the last little topic we're going to talk about is the practical systemic changes um, that businesses can make to level the playing field and Emma I'd love to know your thoughts on that what can businesses do in a bid to level the playing field? Gosh, um, <laughs> there's quite a lot. Um, the thing to- Well, you have touched on a few of these, I should yeah. say. So feel free to you know, just <laughs> reference them again. Um, yeah, so leveling the playing field, really, it comes down to um, recognizing that um, the tech is a subculture. It's a very tricky subculture. You can't lump it in with all diversity and inclusion because women are not a minority group. Women make up more than you know, 50% of the population. So they have to recognize this, the, the ramifications of it being a subculture and tackle those problems. You can't just throw around a few sort of gender specific initiatives, um, which are mostly aimed at women with children, you know, breastfeeding rooms, you know, um, the flexible work thing. There has to be a lot more than that. It has to be systemic. You um, companies have to focus on the systems and processes where the barriers exist for women and examining those really closely and then removing those barriers. Um, so it's not just things that are you know, taking things at face value and definitely move away from lip service. That's what we have to do. There's so much lip service been paid to um, diversity and inclusion for um, you know, gender balance and it's just so unhelpful. So it's not about branding, not treating it as a, as a branding exercise, you know, making us look good or window dressing, so to speak, but actually really getting under the hood and focusing on what needs to be done from a structural, environmental, cultural and systemic perspective to level the playing field. So I, I think, you know, to go into all the details of them will probably take me too long. And I could talk about this stuff all day quite happily, but... Uh -huh. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I think that's, to, to put it broadly, it is about taking a systemic approach to it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Emma. And we will now ask uh, you, for your input for each of you. This is the last poll question that we've got. Um, but what do you think are the three top changes that an organisation could make that you would see having the biggest impact for women in tech? got 10 more seconds for you to answer this one and I'm interested to see how the answers are going to come up for this whether or not there's three clear top winners or whether there's we've touched on really all of those um okay promote more women in leadership yes provide more mentorship yeah I mean so I think it's probably fair to say that there's value in all of those tips I think there's enough of you that have sort of voted with confidence that those are the kinds of things that would make a difference, um, which is really useful information to have. Um, we have now reached um, the end of this session and I just wanted to thank um, all of our panellists and everyone who logged on and joined in this interactive session today. 
I would love to thank our hosts, Talents, um, and say that the results, um, the report that we will put together from this will be available in the coming weeks. So please keep your eyes out for that. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation as the traditional owners of the land. Thank you so much for, all, for your time and for your generous insights. Um, we'll look forward to seeing how we can put them all together. So thank you.